Okay, so Lars Meyer gets prepared for um, his talk, which is the final talk in this morning session. Yeah, yeah. Um, we all know that he comes from the Max Planck Institute of Cognitive uh, and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. And uh, I mean, I don't read that long title, I just say the purpose <laughs> of synchronicity, and you will explain us what that means. Okay, Lars. I don't know whether I'm going to be talking about the purpose, but um, I thought this might maybe provoke some people in the room. So, All right, so in my uh, talk, um, I want to share some of my uh, kind of humble linguist's thoughts about what the actual um, purpose of uh, what, what many people here call entrainment to speech or entrainment to things that are uh, hidden in speech could actually achieve uh, for us in terms of language comprehension. Because I always, like as a linguist, I always was puzzled when I read many of your papers that most of the data that have, pub pub have been published so far, they basically show a temporal alignment between speech rhythms and internal brain rhythms, right? But the goal of all this is understanding what someone has said, right? It's decoding of a message. It's like understanding the symbolic content of it, right? And what's the purpose of all this kind of time locking, face locking um, in terms of understanding something, right? So that's why it's called the purpose of synchronicity, neural oscillations. And I believe neural oscillations align actually neural excitability with uh, linguistic uh, and high level linguistic informativeness. So, if you believe it or not, language comprehension requires syntactic phrasing, right? And that's kind of obvious from uh, this old observation that long lists of random words uh, totally overburden your verbal working memory. So a full list of random words, would you, would, you would hit the roof of your working memory in no time, right? If you have a list such as soldier, tall, waiter, teacher, follows, and old, sad, I don't know how many people of you, I guess you remember them all, right? Okay, but I don't know how many people really remembered each uh, and every single one of these words, and, and uh, let alone its uh, phonological gestalt, right? But if you um, uh, have structure amongst these to be memorized items, um, this benefits your working memory, right? And you have a, have a big benefit for remembering the very same words that comes from the syntactic structure, right? Tall soldier follows waiter and old sad teacher. That's an easy one, right? Same words, same number of syllables, but you can remember the one, you cannot remember the other. So syntactic phrase structure is to me a very sophisticated chunking device. And uh, from these examples, you can see that syntactic phrasing uh, is necessary for language comprehension. Well, um, by now, there's already, I think, three studies out there now that uh, have, I think, quite convincingly so shown that delta band oscillations reflect the uh, formation of syntactic phrase structure. Um, and this is just an example study from, uh, from our group um, where we compared um, a condition where phrases could actually be built. Uh, they were yesterday evening at the, so you have some structure there, it's little sentence fragments. Um, to a condition where you couldn't build up phrases, right? They, the, at, evening, yesterday, where. And we just compare um, these two conditions in a very simple analysis, um, sentence fragments, random word lists to be encoded. Um, we see from the bars here that delta band power, and that's what, what we looked at here, increases for the sentence fragments in particular. And this is visual stimulation. On the left side, this is just all conditions against rest. And uh, this might relate to a discussion we had yesterday already. This effect was, was uh, task unspecific. So we compared um, orthogonally a factor where we had either a working memory task, so you were to kind of um, answer something about the sequence of words after a retention interval, or you just had a lexical decision task down, downstream and so you wouldn't have to remember these words, right? And the effect came out for both uh, tasks. So it seems to be automatic. Yeah. It's a, at least a little indication that this is uh, automatic. Right. Now, syntactic phrasing, uh, or the syntactic phrasing that a listener is supposed to entertain, is uh, only very weakly indexed in the stimulus, right? So, take a sentence such as this one. The client sued the murderer with a corrupt lawyer. Whose lawyer is this, right? It's unclear. 
Yeah? The sentence has two possible syntactic structures hidden underneath, and there's no cue in the input, really, that tells you which of the two structures you're uh, supposed to take. Well, there's these little prosodic cues, right? You could speak the sentence with uh, a single phrase intonation. The client sued the murderer with a corrupt lawyer. Now the murderer has the lawyer. Or you could speak it with the two phrases intonation. The client sued the murderer with the corrupt lawyer. And now the client uh, has the lawyer. Okay, so in principle, there are these little speech prosodic cues, and they are used in language acquisition. That's what the toddlers first hear because they're in the very slow frequency part of the uh, of the speech signal, um, speech prosody. Um, but when we actually ask people after presenting them uh, 150 or so sentences of this type, um, who actually had the lawyer, and we present them the same sentence with both of these prosodic variants, we find that, well, they can clearly dissociate the two prosodic variants, bless you, uh, of the sentence. And you can see this from the fact that there are more client responses to client prosody sentences. Um, so the dashed uh, red bar is higher than uh, client uh, responses to murderer prosody uh, sentences, right? And that's the dashed blue bar, and that's significant. So if you code these two uh, 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 choices in signal uh, detection theoretic terms, you basically get a, a D prime that is significantly above zero, right? So you, participants can dissociate the two prosodic variants. However, there's also a highly significant uh, uh, detection bias, right? And you can see this from, from the uh, solid blue bar and the dashed red bar. There are more client responses to client prosody sentences than there are murderer responses to murderer uh, prosody sentences, right? And so your bias, kind of behaviorally at least, appears to override what's indicated in the speech stream. Yeah? So you kind of ignore that kind of uh, um, physical marking of the syntactic structure, right? So discriminability versus bias, tracking versus imposition, and we discussed this yesterday shortly. Participants have a linguistic phrasing bias, and that's true, I think, for all of these ambiguous sentence structures. That's one of the few cases where you can actually see this kind of bias, right? The stimulus is ambiguous, you could assign multiple structures, but participants always have a certain bias for resolving these, right? And they kind of ignore speech prosody in these cases. And so I think this is really something that shows that the formation of syntactic phrases is really a kind of generative, top-down process that you actively do, and you act upon speech. You don't take it from speech. So delta band oscillations, as we all have read, uh, have been described to kind of track phrases in speech and to follow the phrase structure that is in speech. That's the, that's the Ding study, and that's also compatible with the Bonhager study that I just showed you. But does the delta band also support this, what I call the top-down imposition of phrases or uh, syntactic structure upon the speech stream? And so to find out, we compared now um, trials where participants decided to continue a syntactic phrase in this ambiguous sentence at the offset of the murderer to those trials where uh, participants terminated the phrase. And this is now, as you've seen from the bar plot before, this is orthogonal to speech prosody, right? So this is a two-by-two two design. And we're now looking at the main effect of decision and not of, uh, uh, of, of a pitch track or of prosody or anything. And what we see is that shortly before this syntactic phrase is over at the offset of the murderer, or it's continued for that matter if uh, participants chose the other way around, um, we get a difference in the phase of the uh, ongoing uh, delta band oscillation. Right? So this is what you see here. Uh, that's also the main effect of prosody, of course, and uh, people have described how speech prosody is tracked by maybe delta in the auditory uh, regions, but this, was, this is not an auditory effect. You know, it's orthogonal to the, uh, to the auditory effect. Yeah. And it's even happening before you actually end the phrase. So maybe you even know before what you're going to do at that point in time. Right? Well, we have further evidence from these data that this is actually a uh, top-down process. And uh, this evidence shows that biased participants actually kind of stop listening. So um, this bar plot now shows the coherence between uh, the bandpass-filtered uh, EEG, so the delta bandpass-filtered EEG signal, 
And that part of the speech signal that really codes um, the phrase structure, right? The pitch track. That's where speech prosody sits. And that's what, what kind of marks the rough, very big, coarse constituent boundaries on the sentence level. Right? And we could calculate now a, a speech brain coherence here for all the uh, decisions that participants uh, have been making. Uh, we find that this coherence between uh, the pitch track and the brain signal actually drops whenever participants uh, give a biased response. Right? So whenever, every time they follow their bias, the coherence with a, with a pitch track goes down, and this is uh, significant. And what we then did is that we calculated from the behavioral data the uh, individual signal uh, detection theoretic bias, so the criterion for each participant, and we correlated that with the main effect of uh, coherence reduction. Right? And so for the psycholinguists in the room, you can predict the individual attachment bias, so whether you're a high attacher or a low attacher, can predict this basically from the drop in speech brain coherence. Right? So if you're a biased person, you don't listen. You don't care about what people say. You just like you know it already, and you're going to assign this this syntactic phrase structure to the uh, sentence you just heard, even if it might be wrong. Okay. So this is now everything I've shown so far is uh, in line with uh, what uh, Ding and colleagues have also proposed that maybe one cycle. I know this is a toy model, but you know it's uh, something we, we can work with, at least in this field. And that one cycle of the delta band oscillation corresponds to one syntactic phrase. And I think it's internally generated, basically. So, but that's maybe not so important for the next point that I want to make. Right? So if you have this oscillatory cycle being present, so a single cycle, and this sentence comes in, you're kind of forced to put all the words highlighted in blue into one long phrase. Right? The client suit, the murder with global answer. Okay, and if you have this pattern present of two cycles, a bit faster maybe, um, you kind of are forced to split up this stream of words in the middle and assign a syntactic phrase structure that has uh, two phrases. It's really as simple as that. And that's kind of the, the data I think that has been published so far, this Ding study, and that's, that's the, the things that I've presented so far here, and then I kind of think it's quite credible already. Okay, so... Um, Cool. We have an alignment between a brain oscillation and some structure. I mean, what do we do with it? Have you comprehended the sentence? No, we haven't understood anything, right? What, is, what does it bias? Is it just some, some nice parallelism and it's uh, self similarity and it's fractals? No, I don't think so. I was reading Peter Lakatos' work and, uh, on, uh, on the delta band, and uh, many, of course, of you know this. Um, the phase of the delta band oscillation seems to be related to the excitability of those neurons that actually generate this oscillation, right? So in one part of the oscillatory cycle, the uh, generating neurons are kind of unexcitable, and that's where you're inattentive, that's where you're slow, that's where you're maybe not as accurate. Whereas in the second half of the cycle, um, the underlying neurons are excitable, and you're very attentive to, a, to an incoming uh, stimulus. So now I thought, like, wait, if we have this alignment between the oscillatory cycle and the syntactic phrase, then this would entail that parts of the phrase that co-occur with the unexcitable phase segment of the oscillatory cycle are not really processed very well, whereas parts of the phrase that co-occur with the excitable phase segments, those should be the ones that you process very well. Right? You get it for free, kind of. Once you have this alignment, you get the system in a state that, can, that, can, that it can differentially extract information from within a syntactic phrase. And so to test this, a hypothesis that the alignment between the delta band and the syntactic phrase uh, leads to an implicit alignment of excitability and uh, information within the phrase, we designed a paradigm with little uh, morphosyntactic errors you know, so everything in red is a little morphosyntactic error. It's a, in most cases, it's actually an agreement match, so a mismatch. So an agreement mismatch basically means you have, say, a plural determiner at the onset of a phrase, and then you have a singular adjective or noun coming in. Right? Just that's the simplified version of this manipulation, basically. And we have these violations now at ten steps in the phrase, from the left to the right. Okay? And participants are now to spot these these errors. That's just their task, like spot the error, okay? And uh, these violations, and that's I think the crucial point of this, and this is 
why I think this is related to information processing, these occur now at time points where the syntactic phrase internally differs in its informativeness in information theoretic terms. Okay, so how do we quantify this? Syntactic informativeness is the degree of expectedness of a given abstract syntactic category at a given moment in time to follow another syntactic category. So in this case, after an article, after a determiner, after the, there will be a noun. Whatever noun it is, but there will be a noun. And you're pretty sure about this, right? If an adjective comes up, well, this is possible. The big cat, this is also fine. You know, it's fine with the, with the syntactic phrase structure that you have acquired when you were a toddler. However, it's a, it's a little less expected. It's a little more surprising. You could play this on forever. You could integrate because the phrase structure is so flexible, right? You could introduce an adverb, the very big cat, and this is even more surprising. Yeah? So that's the information content that is in the syntactic structure. It's got nothing to do with the lexicon. It's got nothing to do with semantics. It's purely based on the syntactic category, but they are informative. So what, you, what we can do is we take a, a computational parsing model a probabilistic context-free grammar, basically, and we train it on a so-called tree bank. A tree bank is a database of uh, a large number of sentences. In this case, it's 60,000 annotated sentences, and they have little tree structures. Some student assistant has drawn 60,000 tree structures for these sentences. Yeah? And based on these tree structures, you can calculate the surprises of the information content of the syntactic category at every single moment in every single one of these 60,000 sentences. Once you've trained this computational parser, you can just take your list of stimuli, run it through the parser, and it will tell you for your stimuli which word is uh, how high in syntactic information content. Okay? So now we basically know for each of our 10 violations how informative the syntactic phrase was at every single one of these 10 points in the phrase. So first, we're, of course, proposing for the behavior, because that's what people have found before, an optimal detection performance and unsurprising context. Right? That's in line with much of the probabilistic parsing literature. Then we, of course, also were uh, hypothesizing to replicate the uh, published data on the alignment between the delta band cycle and the syntactic phrase. Right? We should show this, otherwise this is all maybe rubbish. Um, and then it becomes interesting, because I think violation detection should be predicted by the uh, phase gradient that is resulting from the alignment between the delta band oscillation and the syntactic phrase. And this would kind of um, point to the idea that uh, the delta syntax alignment results in an implicit alignment of uh, neural excitability to predicted uh, uh, or uninformative uh, syntactic information. Okay, let's look at the behavioral data first. Um, increasing predictability, roughly increasing predictability of the syntactic category across the syntactic phrase. That's what we already saw in the stimulus description. On the z-axis, you have uh, the, the information content, basically, of e at each of these 10 time points. On the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have reaction time. Right? And you can see that reaction time kind of nicely decreases towards the right edge of the phrase, and that's also uh, the side of the phrase to where uh, the syntactic information content is uh, decreasing. So behaviorally, uh, this appears to work. Okay? Morphosyntactic violations in highly predictive contexts, so violations that are informative because you didn't expect them, uh, are easily detected. Check. Uh, this is significant still when we correct for the time point of violation occurrence, right? which could have been a problem resulting from the uh, experimental paradigm that we were using. Um, and this is generally in line with probabilistic psycholinguistic models that derive processing demands from syntactic predictability. So, okay, good to have. Behavioral paradigm seems to work. Now, second hypothesis. Um, in the topography, basically, this is the topography of the phase concentration parameter of the uh, bandpass filtered signal average across the 10 violation time points. And uh, what you can see is that the concentration of phase across participants in the delta band is highly significant here um, across the whole syntactic phrase. And it's there in every single one of those 10 bins that we saw. Right? And this could be taken as 
evidence that there was kind of an alignment between uh, the syntactic phrases and the oscillatory cycle. Yeah? Okay, so this is just a replication so far. What you can see from the rows plots below, yeah, so every, every one of these 10 data points is a subject, and you can see that within each of the 10 violation positions, um, you see the high concentration, but you can also see that the face angle slowly shifts across the phrase, right? And that's what we wanted, kind of. It gets more apparent even um, from, from uh, this graphic, where I'm plotting basically all trials of all participants uh, sorted by their uh, oscillatory phase. No? Uh, bandpass filter delta, yeah, thanks. It's uh, 0.5 to 4 hertz, I think. Yeah, just a coarse bandpass thing. Thanks for asking, yeah. So, and this is now all trials of all participants uh, sorted by their uh, oscillatory phase, okay? And on the left, what you see is the mode of the uh, violation position from 1 to 10. And on the right side, you see, <laughs> this is complex, you see on the z-axis the syntactic information content, and you see on the y-axis the behavior, the reaction time. And this is now sorted by phase, right? So what you can see is that late violation positions in the phrase, they associate with phase segments between minus pi and zero, very consistently. And that's also the part of the phrase where you're fast in responding, and that's where the information content is low. At the onset of the phrase, you predominantly find phase segments between 0 and pi. And from the right plot, you can see that this is the point of the phrase where the information content is very high, and that's where you're also very slow. Right? So I think uh, this is already quite nice, because we can show that somehow the informativeness kind of maps onto the oscillatory cycle. But what does this have to do with neural excitability? Well, and I didn't plan this immediately, but I thought, wait, I have a morphosyntactic violation. I can do an ERP analysis on it, right? Because we know that uh, morphosyntactic violations, they're accompanied by an early negativity in the ERP, which is called the LAN, the left anterior negativity. And I thought that, and which might be generated by uh, regions or aspects of the temporal lobe and uh, might be related to kind of low-level detection of uh, kind of high-level errors, if you so will. Yeah? So I thought that... Uh, if this, is, if this is related to neural excitability, I should see a difference in the amplitude of this ERP to the morphosyntactic violation um, in the course of the syntactic phrase as well, right? And so here again, um, I sorted the amplitude of the uh, LAN. This is the topography. Don't look at the red blob. Only look at the negativity over the left anterior uh, sensors, please, just for the matter of the argument. Yeah. And I took the amplitude in this time window between 300 and 500 milliseconds and again sorted all trials um, by uh, their phase. And you can see easily that the amplitude of the left anterior negativity now increases uh, across the syntactic phrase. Such that late violations in the phrase that are not particularly informat uh, informative and where the response is fast, this is accompanied by a large LAN response. And uh, early parts of the phrase, where the phrase is very informative and your processing is slow, there you get a small LAN. And now this gradient is correlated with the oscillatory phase of the uh, delta frequency oscillation uh, 300 milliseconds before. So oscillatory phase during the occurrence of a syntactic violation predicts your electrophysiological detection of the violation 300 milliseconds downstream. So I think this now allows for the claim that delta band phase alignment between uh, syntactic phrases and the oscillatory cycle might be actually a proxy to steer neural excitability to high-level linguistic information content that is kind of hidden in the abstract structure underlying uh, the phrase and that you have projected from the top down. Okay, um, my conclusions. Delta band oscillations appear to subserve the top-down imposition of syntactic phrases upon the speech stream, and this even reduces the reliance on bottom-up uh, acoustic or prosodic cues. Uh, when 
oscillatory cycles and syntactic phrases align, your neural excitability is implicitly aligned with high-level linguistic informativeness, and this in turn facilitates the lower-level electrophysiological processing and behavioral processing of genuine syntactic information. Okay? So I'm claiming uh, that the purpose of synchronicity between delta band cycles and syntactic structure is the alignment of neural excitability with uh, syntactic, so high-level linguistic uh, information within syntactic phrases. So kind of the goal of uh, language comprehension, if you so will. So uh, thanks to my mentor, Angela Filerizzi, for letting me do this work. Uh, thanks to my colleagues in Frankfurt, Osnabrück, and uh, Ontario, and thanks to my students, uh, especially Matthias uh, Gumbert, who I think hates me a lot because he had to do all these violations and had to design this, this paradigm in a master's thesis. Uh, so he, he had a tough labor there. And thanks to Phoebe in uh, Maryland and Nora in Mannheim, and thanks for your attention. So, uh, thank you very much, Lars. Uh, uh, Jonas has a question. Thanks very much for this. Um, I wondered whether you could tell us a bit more about... Um, okay, so, no, I put it differently. So, what I had in my head when I see these data is that you're, you, what you are doing is uh, violation detection, mm. right? Is that correct? Mm. Uh, like for this main study that you showed in the end. So, and I think you mentioned it in passing that there's, uh, there's a temporal hazard, of course. So, I'm in your yeah. experiment and I'm detecting this little thing. I mean, it's a, it's a super smart uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of setup. But it's, on the other hand, like you can, I cannot kind of not look at these data and think yes. like, in how far can I account for, well, mm. but for the sake of controversy, all of it by saying it's temporal uh, hazard yeah. or a yeah. prediction. And yeah. so I would like just to hear your point on this and see how you actually also kind of dealt with this statistically yeah. so you can In the first place I didn't argument. and so it got rejected, ha, huh? of course. <laughs> And uh, in the second step, I looked at the distribution of the information content again, right? And it's not, strictly speaking, a linear relationship between time point and information content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can basically take the time points of the violation occurrence and calculate the residual of the reaction times, and that's still correlated with the information content. So the correlation gets weaker, mm -hmm. so there is something mm -hmm. about the paradigm, mm -hmm. and I totally mm -hmm. agree on this, mm -hmm. and I haven't really thought about that when I designed the experiment. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really a flaw of the mm -hmm. thing, but the correlation still holds, even if we calculate the residual from, from the time point of violation occurrence. Very brief, uh, am I allowed a brief follow-up? Just um, the other thing that I, that I love and that confuses me at the same time <laughs> is this delta, um, the, the little rose plots you're showing. Yeah. So I'm trying to, that's good that Odette asked also, so we know it's about a one hertz um, oscillation, but like shouldn't this guy like move around the cycle in this time? Yes, exactly. Yeah, very weird, very weird. I mean, in the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah no, totally, yes, it follows me. Yeah, yeah, totally. I was expecting <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for cycle, didn't come up. So I mean, in, in Dink's study, they find like the sentence level thing as well, you know, and they find the, the, the faster frequency phrase level things, maybe a different bandpass filter. It's, it's really, it, it puzzled me as well. It's still, so the difference in, in, uh, in phase angle between the, between the bins is still significant, right? It comes out in the F test and comes out in most of the T tests. So it's fine, yeah, I'm puzzled. So my take on it is, um, well, I mean, maybe, what delta does is not really related to the fine-grained phrase structure, but it's just related to the major constituent boundaries, and this would rather predict something that is very sluggish on the sentence level. Yeah. I was discussing this with, with uh, Peter Hachot a couple of weeks ago and with many people uh, last night, and he suggested that um, maybe the way that I'm modeling information content here is not really, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on syntactic terms because I, I, I read the Ding study, and I did the study on syntax before, so I think we should get started with looking at syntactic informativeness, because that's the data we have, and that's what we can form the new hypothesis from. But there are many different other ways to quantify linguistic informativeness. You could quantify lexical, you could engram, calculate the engram. You could also look at information structure. Where's the in important information on the sentence level, right? Linguists call this information structure. There's always something, like one important... Uh, uh, entity in the sentence. Jonas was yesterday talking about pianos, and then it all became wild, right? And everyone was like, okay, this is about pianos. And so maybe, maybe the alignment that, that I have to search for is really 
somewhere else, on some different layer on the <laughs> information theoretic modeling, basically. So, um, yeah, like I say, I just did it based on the prior evidence, but it could be that actually there's, there's an alignment to something slower frequency that happens on a slower frequency uh, scale on the sentence level. Yeah. Well, you know, in that, in that line, I, you know, I want to say something that stems from from the um, you know the um, observation that I had, questions that came up in uh, the theta domain. I mean, how, what is the role of oscillation in a single word recognition? <laughs> you you just throw one word. You know, what time do you have for the theta to get into the picture? And do the words same, exist? No, no. But it's you know, oscillation needs some time to develop. Yeah. And the question here is why wouldn't you use some carrier in the delta range before you enter into your phrase to see if indeed it is related to, to delta? You see what I'm saying? I mean, you, you, you just run with one sentence mm -hmm. that is maybe a delta long cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm suggesting a stimulus preparing, you know, or entraining mm. a delta, and then yeah. let your sentence come in yeah, and, yeah. and check that phase. Yeah, yeah. We're doing this right now, actually. So we are trying to induce, a, induce basically a delta rhythm with neurostimulation, and then fool people with mm -hmm. phrases that match the rhythm or not, right? And see whether we get some, some tiny little reaction time difference and they're being fooled or something. You, know? you could consider a similar thing when you, when you think about turn-taking, right? Because people are very precise in turn-taking. They have time window of, like, I think it's below 100 milliseconds or so, right? They're super fast in reacting and taking turns, right? So they kind of predict the end of the phrase of, of the other speaker, right? And what happens if I take a speaker who has a very regular phrase rhythm and he always makes these weird 10 syllable long phrases, and uh, I'm expecting to take my turn now, and all of a sudden he's giving me a 15-syllable phrase, right? And I will definitely interrupt him or something. So th that's a similar way of, of looking at that, yeah. Okay, Andrea. So I know we've discussed this before, but I have to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why do you say chunking and not forming a proposition or composing something? Uh, good question. What and would you call it? Composition. Composition. I would say you know that you're detecting units that you're going to. I don't know whether that's composition because no one has shown that it is composition. But well, I think there's a lot of formal evidence that that we. No, on the that. neural level, like showing that there's actually, you know, compositionality happening when I have five words and they form a phrase that I get like a well, compositional new representation. Like no one has shown that. That's the other point, though, is that there's lots of other structure in there that you're ignoring. Mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. This you mean? Yeah, I don't yeah. know why. It's just at that mark where you decided the delta phase starts, right? Why not? What about the verb before, where there's lots of information about structure and phrases? That are yeah, there? that's theoretical assumptions, right? So it's depending on whether you need to use a left corner parser or well, whatever you, you assume. Well, you know what I think yeah. about informative. So I think as far as, as, as I know, the, the parser that I use, that's the rock parser. Mm -hmm. And that's based on a left corner top-down thing, right? Mm -hmm. So the information content is, of course, kind of biased by that procedure, yeah. In that respect, you're, you're, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering where you have thought of using something like Jabberwocky to get rid of the semantics in your stimuli. Hmm. And just get the, you know, I mean, because you're trying to make a claim exclusively mm. about syntax, right? Yes. So wouldn't it have been nicer to use stimuli that were mostly driven by syntactic? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, you're right in a way. I just always think that Jabberwock is such a weird thing, and I don't know what people but do exactly when they hear. Exactly, because of that, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, <laughs> you just you just buy in as many new processes as you just got rid of. So that's that's just always my feeling. So, but in principle, that's a that's a good idea. Yeah, I think so because you could calculate the information content just as well. It would be interesting whether you could actually do it. I think from computational terms, because of course, the parser that you want to run over your stimuli it needs to know the lexicon. Mm -hmm. And if you bombard it with words that it hasn't seen, it will just maybe present an error message or something because it doesn't know these, these words. I wonder whether the parser could actually, Andrea could tell me whether the parser would actually just work on inflection morphology, but I doubt it. No. So and in principle, so yeah, you would first need a, a Jabberwocky corpus. I, I think right. it should work. 
on yeah. Java Walkie. Yeah, but you need a Java Walkie corpus to train it on. You need like 60,000 Java Walkie sentences, train the parser, and then you can tag 15 new Java Walkie sentences. Yeah, otherwise, it, I think it wouldn't fly. Okay, I have now you know a couple of more you know questions, uh, and, and I just list you it. So it's Marcel, Nina, Anlise, and then David, and I think we should close it after that, and then just now see you know what the new questions are. So Marcel. Uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much for this really very exciting stuff. I've never thought about Delta in relation to language comprehension, so that's that's really cool to see. Now you have to. Um, I'm, I mean, this obviously begs the question, how, how would that relate to the things that I've been observing, especially in the beta range, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if beta is something that tracks sentences and delta is something that tracks phrases, did you, did you have the occasion to look at cross-frequency coupling between the two or, no. whether, or other kinds of no, interrelationships? No. Because that's what, that would be the obvious next step then, yes. right? Yes, 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 yes. You would, yeah, if you if you take it in terms of, of predictions, then maybe the delta phase alignment entrains kind of some like faster oscillation underneath that kind of does something. I think the reason for it is really it's from kind of it's a it's a top down thing in my head. Yeah. So the Ding study and the, my my previous attachment ambiguous study they are all designed in terms of syntax kind of. And so I'm looking at the syntactic information content, right? And for beta, I don't have like. Like, uh, unlike you, I don't have a hypothesis that it relates to syntax at all. Like, for me, it's, a, it's something that relates to the N4 and that's, that's uh, relating to kind of the n-gram and, and contextual predictions that are purely non-syntactic. So, but that's not a strong epistemological reason, right? So, in principle, yeah, I should look at it. I mean, when you, when you consider this whole theory that the slowest frequency oscillation should maybe be the pacemaker in the cortex and dictate maybe the rhythm of all the faster frequencies, then it should definitely be there. Yeah, I mean, you, sh you see it in, uh, in in speech perception that uh, that the delta kind of um, uh, entrains the theta band and maybe trickling down to the gamma. Yeah, and Joachim Gross has published this brilliant study on how the delta from the prefrontal cortex kind of aligns the the, the the labor and the auditory cortex. Peter Lakatos work. So yes, in principle, it's just that I don't have strong hypotheses there. I'm, I'm not in line. May I answer that? No. Okay. It's a short I'll try. comment. It's not only the slowest ones that can um, uh, that can produce the higher frequency ones. Sometimes the higher frequency ones can act as a kind of reverse phase amplitude coupling mm -hmm. and determine the lower ones. And I suspect that happens sometimes in speech and maybe in at least parts of those deltas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So I just wonder whether you can bring back the slide where you had one versus two cycles for the... Ah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. toy model, yeah. And so... Um, I wonder whether you can help me. So what I'm, what I'm struggling is like, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, that's great, you know? And I can <laughs> totally see this if, this if we're talking about representational kind of offline case. Mm. But if I now have to bring the real time in, which I think, and you're basically trying to say that, you know, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that delta is a chunking mechanism for constituent items, the same way that say theta is a chunking mechanism for syllable mm. items. Mm -hmm. So if I have to do this, for chunking constituents in real time, you know? And imagine I'm the blue line, right? And I've decided that this is gonna be my constituent. Um, so what do I do in the case, you know, when I get to the murderer and then the next word actually must be a constituent. So the client sued the murderer yesterday, you know? So like, do you see what- But so, the murderer yesterday? So yesterday is not part of That's the song, he's my yesterday session. man or something, right? So you can be a yesterday murderer, I think. But anyway. Uh, well, okay. Uh, uh, the client sued the murderer and, you know, ran away. Mm -hmm. So do so I... So you mean on syntactic terms it has to be a constituent, but you cannot exactly. help. But yeah, I, I would guess there's an error then. Yeah. You run into your own trap. So, I mean, but surely I can process those sentences. So. Uh, what I'm basically, I think I'm, what, what I'm trying to ask is like, I can understand the story if it's about delta, res like resetting of the face, mm -hmm. right? But if it's about 
you know, kind of using this ongoing oscillation and fitting in everything that you have into the ongoing oscillation, that's where I kind of crash. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if this is true, it would mean that phrases and sentences that are actually produced are much more regular than we think, right? So you maybe at the beginning you establish a rhythm of two, three phases that all have f phrases that all have the same length, and then the remainder is the same way. But I haven't seen any publication that has really done a systematic analysis on, of this on the utterance level. So, yeah, this is actually the claim that I'm making. Yeah. There's some evidence from boundary perception, though, where you know that the relative length of the, uh, of the IPBs like the, your perception of an IPB depends on the length of the IPBs before and of the magnitude of the IPBs before. So there seems to be something something there. You never perceive an IPB independently. You perceive it in terms of its relation to the other IPBs. Just a quick so. note, you're also, I, I guess, um, sensitive to the word duration, right? Mm. So like a man with a cat is different for your story from like a, I don't know, an astronaut with a caterpillar, just because an astronaut with a caterpillar takes longer and therefore... Yeah, but I don't know from, from, from quantitative analysis of, of speech corpora whether this is actually taking longer. Maybe people speed up. Maybe okay, people, so people even introduce additional syllables like uh, just to keep this mm, rhythm, right? It, that's, that's actually what I'm thinking. Or they, they make a little pause just to make it fit. Um, thanks for the talk. I'm going to ask a very naive question. So, so if delta has to do with syntax, uh, what uh, do you think would uh, sort of reset the, the, the delta in, uh, when there is no violation, like in normal speech? Uh, what is the anchor point for you? Your internal Syntactically. knowledge. Syntactically. Your internal knowledge is the anchor point. You project the structure. Your, your, internal, your, ah. inter your internal knowledge is the anchor point. No, you but I mean, in the, so one cycle, one phrase. Mm -hmm. What in the phrase is the what is going to drive the phase of your de delta? Nothing. Or is it the other way around? Nothing. Your internal knowledge does it. Mm. In this case, it's probabilistic. I mean, like, like we discussed yesterday in the Ding study, there's nothing in the stimulus that indicates this. There's an international no. phrase boundary no, no, and no, people no, no, ignore no. it. Not in the stimulus, but syntactically. I guess it's quantitative, like based on language acquisition. Yeah. I mean, no one knows how the how this bias in, in this particular ambiguity. Mm. What the reason is for this bias? Whether this is a working memory limitation mm. that phrases have to have a certain length, or whether this like a lower or upper limit to the to the delta band frequency. Um, what the exact limiter is, I don't know. I mean, I'm claiming it's the it's the wavelength of the delta band. Yeah. But it could as well be that this that this is more variable than we think. Yeah. All I'm saying is that this is something internal and related to the wavelength of the oscillation. Yeah. How that translates to linguistic terms and grammatical concepts, I'm not really I'm not really sure. Yeah. Okay, David. Yeah, I'm finding myself a little frustrated because I'm extremely sympathetic to what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I, I like the direction, I like, uh, I like the, um, the spirit of the proposal. But there are three things, uh, like serious things, missing for me. Mm -hmm. And the first is what we're, what's been come up briefly now, which is we really actually do need some statistical characterization cross-linguistically of phrase lengths of different types. And the, so, you know, here's an idea. They're going to be between one and three seconds on the mean or something like that. If that's true, then there's a game in town, right? Mm -hmm. so then there's actually uh, information that can be used. And then this uh, sort of delta cyclicity will be informative in a deep sense. For the, the things about the particular study that make me a little, you know, it's, it goes back to Jonas's question. So if we, for instance, show, uh, if you can briefly show your behavioral data, Mm -hmm. um, I simply don't need to see. Yep. Th that's basically for me captured in the. In the uh, that's hazard rate. Yeah. That's the hazard rate. So that's the unresidualized reaction time. Yeah, that's the raw reaction time. Yeah. So the residual looks more like Look, the. Does, so do you really get cyclicity in the raw reaction time? Do I get what? So in the, so both here and in the rose plots. I guess I'm failing to appreciate the true cyclicity that you would need to be true for yes. this to be, yeah, yeah. right? So, so and that leaves me a little unsatisfied because I want you yes. to be right, yeah. but both the behavior I, and I the physiology leave, um, let me, leave me yeah. it unsatisfied. Doesn't, yeah, it, doesn't fit this, uh, it doesn't this, fit this, this the elegance of the yeah. model. Yeah. It's not matched by the data, and yeah. so that's a problem. Here, I right? agree. 
I agree. Yeah. But I always have to say, in the Dink study, the alignment was forced, right? And we don't know whether for natural speech you really have it, or whether the alignment is to some other periodicity that is maybe in information theory, theme, ream, topic, focus, something like that. So, I mean, yeah, this, if, if this would be a field where people look where people work totally data-driven, then now we would have to say, okay, no, there's no alignment no. between oscillatory <laughs> phase and syntactic cycles. Right? Yeah. Well, um, I think at this point uh, we should close and uh, sort of uh, thank uh, again Lars. First. Thank you. <laughs>